You're not afraid of the dark, are you? It's the sound of your death. We keep heaven packed with fresh souls. The peak of your civilization. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity. You're an errand boy. And deeper we go, my beloved true seekers. Contraband Alice's, Persephone's, Inanna's, and Sophia's plunging into the depths of the abyss in order to regain your own divine sanity and salvific memories stolen by the chthonic lords of ignorance and black intoxication. I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. Like an Orpheus holding a harp of fury, or a Jesus armed with a cross of light, you descend into the underworld of your nightmares and the nightmare dimensions crafted by the Ancient of Days and his angelic Freddy Kruegers. You dare levels of scarred reality to rescue all ultimate truths imprisoned in Pandora cages guarded by boss suit wearing manticores with their sharp claws soaked in dream killing poison and church pulpit medusas whose gaze petrifies your individuality we don't want cooperation we want conversion we want repentance and after each contest gain part of a truth that works for your spiritual augmentation. Then you come for sustenance and provisions to the metaphysical Lothlorien called Aeon Bite Gnostic Radio, broadcast from one of the districts of the virtual Alexandria through the God Above God Dad Cam. And afterward you must go deeper to challenge even greater horrors and their marketing campaigns and Iron Maiden Holy Writs. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. So rest for a moment or a thousand and welcome with kindness and love. I am and I am Abraxas, that terrible, sanity-destroying personification of the Pleroma, that uber daemon and solar logos the ancients feared, and so should the modern, wearing those doughy faces from the movie The Wall over their souls. And those of you slowly releasing yourselves from your waking sleep, Experiencing that oceanic feeling Freud wrote about can summon the blazing gnosis of Abraxas as you journey deeper into that rabbit hole called the world of forms. I am not a number, I am a free man! But often Jehovah and his angelic Freddy Kruegers through their new age courtesans will tell you you can be a god because everything is god and god is everything and happiness is a choice and footprints in the sand and life is not a mystery to be solved yes everything is god right even the nutty turd you left unflushed this morning the hidden kitty porn of one of your neighbors, a pile of vomit in your back alley, or the cries of some innocent kitten being beaten to death by psychopath teens blocks away. Someday a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. Why be God then? Why not be more? As the apocalypse of Adam and the paraphrase of Shem educate us, we are meant to be higher than all the gods, part of the limitless light without boundaries the Sethians wrote about. And like the Gospel of Philip states, we created the gods as some sort of guilt-ridden and control projection reflex, but ultimately those gods should worship us. Without our imagination and blood, they cannot last. The people desert the temples. They turn from the gods. What gods? You prophets and priests made the gods that you may prey upon the fears of men. And you are the Gnostics, the lovers of the Esoterica, 
and the Dionysian freethinkers. You have lost your mind and come to your senses. You run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. You are a body shatva, Johnny Cash's. You are a legend, the revenge of the myth and the 20th level anti-paladins raging against heaven with your holy avenger machine guns loaded with bullets of apocalypse. At my signal, unleash hell. And I know that I often call the Gnostics Galahad existentialists, and that is true to an extent, as a great Hans Jonas would agree. But I think the distinguished occult scholar Colin Wilson put it in a slightly better context when he referred to us as the outsiders, those possessing something called Faculty X that separates us from those lobotomized by the god of this world. Perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. We are those who have one foot in the material colonies and one foot in the ethereal borderlands. We are those who cannot and will never belong to pre-manufactured historical actor roles because our gaze crosses into all points of plot and theater, time and space. We are those who are too sensitive for the porcupine realities of a vulturine universe and its hellhound eat hellhound planets. Brother, life's a bitch. She's back in heat. We are those who suffer twice as much because we carry not only our own suffering, but breathe in the suffering of every form of life, every lost spirit, every shard of the Godhead trapped in matter. And we are those who can only express our anguish of the ersatz systems that surround us through the beauty of our hell-born art, our research of what is factually true, our compassionate crusades to aid others to find their own inner silver surfers. They call us mad, dangerous, and useless because we won't play their LARP charades that calcify us into mediocrity. You're all individuals! Yes, we're all individuals! They want to get rid of us, the earthly rulers and the heavenly princes, because we are a threat to their elaborate galactic Ponzi schemes that fragment the collective human psyche. And some good examples of famous outsiders throughout history, as Colin Wilson points out, which I'm sure many of you can relate to, are Kafka, Nietzsche, Blake, Dostoevsky, H.G. Wells, and Philip K. Dick, just to name a few. You, we are outsiders, going deep into that rabbit hole, champions eternal, kings for a day and fools for many lifetimes. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. And, as I've explained in past episodes of Aeon Bite, one of the Archon's greatest chicaneries and keeping us outsiders unbalanced and the rest of the sheep docile to be cornholed by religious shepherds is the hiding of the many aspects of the divine feminine principle in certain Pandoric boxes and how you can release them and experience them. Mother is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children. And one of the most abused and misunderstood yet important divine feminine principles is our topic today, my beloved true seekers. She has been many things to many cultures throughout ancient history, conventionally accepted as a Greek goddess of the underworld. She was referred to as the triple goddess, the key bearer, mistress of the restless dead, ruler of heaven and sea, and lady of the crossroads. Yet her origins are older than the Greco-Roman era, perhaps as far back as the dawn of human civilization. Her original attribute was being a major creator deity of transcendental qualities, and her name is Hecate. You, no trouble. Me, 
protective element. Supreme being me protect you. She endured as one of the main salvific figures in various civilizations until the Abrahamic faiths ended her prominence. Yet the worship and fascination of Hecate never truly died out. The interest in this arcane goddess has gotten a glossy erection with the revival of the neo-pagan religions. So on this approximately Saturday, June 26, the year of our Demiurge 2010, we get acquainted with the real Hecate, from her mystical rule in days of old to her occult role in these new days, from her soul-liberating teachings to her dangerous gifts. Can't you see all around you the dragon's breath? And this important task is aptly handled by our astral guest, Sorita Deste, editor and contributing writer of Hecate, Her Sacred Fires, as well as author of Practical Elemental Magic, Practical Kabbalah Magic, and several other books. And Sorita, besides being a kindly, adroit, and sober scholar of pagan traditions, is also a skillful theurgist and, as we discuss off the air in detail, a burgeoning Gnosticoi. For more information on this priestess of Hecate, please visit her website, sorita.co.uk. That's S O R I T A. We are found the witch, might we burn, huh? And yes, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing Hecate. It should be Hecate. Or Hecate. My partner in blasphemy, Jim West, always reminds me that I'm making a bollocks out of Greek words. It's not my fault the Hellenists didn't learn to speak Queen's English like the original Bible authors. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! Regardless, Sorita's new book, Hecate or Sacred Fires, is definitely worth a slot in your sacrilegious library if you're interested in knowing Hecate or the goddess archetype. Not only does Sorita present her own Luciferian illumination on Hecate, she invited a legion of scholars, witches, artists, neo-pagan evangelists, and just plain lovers of the esoterica to contribute an array of insightful yet often personal articles on the Lady of the Crossroads and of course several rituals for your own theosophical daring. God bless those pagans. And that is important because Sorita and her contributors do a yeoman's work in finding the true Hecate or Hecate. After all, the Middle East and its surrounding lands in ancient times were a syncretic chunky soup of theology and mysticism that lasted through the end of the Roman Empire. Deities and godmen were imported and exported, crossbred as cultures fingered one another. New governments and priestly classes modified or manufactured godlings to suit their agendas and the changing times. Sometimes the gods bless you in the morning and curse you in the afternoon. Savvy hierophants and wandering clerics tweaked their proselytizing to suit different audiences. The mystery religions quietly adapted to their surroundings like mystic chameleons in order to continue their underground rituals of soul liberation. So many of the gods and goddesses were patchworks of older divine principles, while others were simply confused by later historians. They also change with the spiritual evolution or devolution of different societies. Some Roman godmen named Jesus Christ as the perfect example. There's no such thing as the Star of Bethlehem. Jesus was born in North Africa. How come in pain does it always look like he's one of the Bee Gees? All right, Christmas ideas that don't shriek of meanness. Hey, your people stole Jesus from my people. But in the end, with a Horus eye, Many of these deities can be witness and experience in their unique primordial and encompassing form. Hecate is certainly one of them, 
being not only an original Createx, but also a female Logos, the reason or first thought of the monad that we find in Gnosticism in the forms of Barbalo or the Enoya. And as Sorita points out, the similarities of Hecate and Sophia are striking in the Chaldean oracles. Blasphemers, idolaters! An example of what I've been blathering about is Barbara Walker when she writes in her book, Man Made God, that Hecate was, quote, one of the oldest Greek versions of the Trinitarian goddess, derived from the Egyptian midwife goddess Hekit, Heket, or Hekat, who in turn evolved from the Hek, or tribal matriarch of pre-dynastic Egypt. A wise woman, in command of all the Herkau, or mother's words of power. Walker further points out that the etymology of Hek is akin to that of Log in Logos in Greek. In other words, her breath or voice in antediluvian mythologies not only brings life to the cosmos, but also spirit to humanity and cosmic awakening to those who wish her lunar donations. Give me some sugar, baby. And that's a far cry from just being some cougar goddess of the night, as modern occultism has relegated her to. You found me beautiful once. Honey, you got real ugly. I myself thought that for many years. My first experience with Hecate was at 13, opening the first edition of Deities and Demigods to play Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. You know, the one that actually had the Melnibonian Pantheon? I gawked at this hot, topless, lawful, evil, blonde milf, but they made her into just a lesser goddess. I was still mesmerized and had a little happy wood, I must admit. God bless Gary Gagax. But from then on, I saw her as just some minor Lilith figure that Thelemites, Wiccans, and Satanists could call upon because she was such a dirty girl, as Rick James sang. It seems the occult did to Hecate the same thing Orthodoxy did to Mary Magdalene and Sophia. How do you write women so well? I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. But thanks be to Akamoth, to tireless explorers of the truth like Sorita, who truly brings alive the amazing mythopoeia of Hecate. Let Sorita truly give us her majesty and remove the tabloid folklore surrounding her. And after the interview, I shall reveal to you that Hecate even makes an appearance at Gnosticism. In other words, enough of my Pandoric drivel. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us today we have the pleasure of having Sorita Dieste to discuss her new book, Hecate, Her Sacred Fires. How are you doing today, Sorita? I'm doing fine, Miguel. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is all ours. Before we get into the book, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you encountered Hecate, or, or maybe how she encountered you? My own magical background and spiritual background goes back to, um, as a teenager, I had an interest in the occult that was already established at that time. And I encountered some Alexandrian Wiccan initiates and became initiated into that tradition, which is where I first encountered Hecate within a ritual context. But before that, as a child, I, you know, read about her myths and her stories within the classical poetry and literature, which my grandmother, Manona, often um, encouraged me to read. So my own introduction came through literature and poetry, but my ritual introduction came through um, Alexandrian Wicca. And uh, Sorita, where in literature and poetry did you find her? Um, a lot of the romantic poets and um, just the classical stories of the descent of uh, Persephone away from her mother Demeter into the underworld to be the wife of um, Hades. 
Um, so just all the kind of classical stories um, associated with art, the kind of things that you read as a child and maybe not fully understand at the time, but it remains with you and you remember it and it kind of makes more sense when you're older. And Sorita, can you tell us about or tell us why you decided to orchestrate her sacred fires and the process you went through in order to bring this to the world? Well, the reason I brought it together is a little bit complicated, really. I, about four or five years ago, I produced a book called Hecate, Keys to the Crossroads, which was a collection of essays and prose and ritual material from various people within the Wiccan and pagan community in the UK. It's a volume that I've gotten many comments on over the years, and many people said to me, when are you going to do another one? You should do a follow-on. You should um, do another one. It, it was you know, fantastic to read about all these different people and their experiences with this goddess, Hecate, that is you know, so important within the modern pagan witchcraft and magical revival. Um, and I always said, well, I don't really see the point. I've already done it. There's not really a reason to do another one. You know, Hecate Keys to the Crossroads was special because of the way that, you know, it was created by mostly a group of friends. Then last year, following the yearly Hecate Supper that I organised in August, I was going to have a break from working with Hecate to focus a little bit on other ritual work that I wanted to do. And my work has kind of changed quite a lot from more, you know, witchcraft, sorcery-based work um, into a lot more theogic work um, in the last few years. And I was performing a rite in November in my temple sanctuary. I I work very closely with the seven wandering stars, and that's really important in my own um, personal spirituality. And I invoke Dionysus as part of my ritual, and I was scrying into fire after dancing for quite some time. And I had this vision of many small torches within the fire, um, kind of showing on top of the map of the world. And immediately I thought, okay, so this is Hecate's torches on the map of the world. This must represent the many places where she's you know, seen today, where she's invoked, where she's evoked and worshipped today. Later that evening, I just found myself thinking, well, you know, another project might be what was necessary. And in a state of slight kind of still a little bit ungrounded from doing ritual work, I emailed some friends and I was like, you know, guys, do you want to contribute to um, an anthology about Hecate and share your experiences and stuff as a follow on to Hecate Keys to the Crossroads? And within days, it was very clear that this was a fun, you know, fantastic idea that many people wanted to do something like this. And, you know, I had many people recommend more friends and people get in touch through very social networking sites um, to offer contributions. So all in all, there is more than 50 people from all over the world, um, as far as part as India, Australia, Mexico, Chile, the United States. States, Sweden, just all over the world, literally, there are people that contributed to this, and all their contributions kind of, you know, fit together in a very, very interesting way, because it's people who are not connected through any particular tradition or any social um, community. In fact, for, for many reasons, they should be very, very different in their approaches to her, um, because they come from so many different spiritual, religious and magical backgrounds that it's not really something that you'd expect people to be in the same opinion of. It's not something that you'd expect people to be in agreement about their opinions on Hecate, but many people who contributed, even though they never knew each other before the project started, it's clear from their stories and from their experiences that they're definitely speaking about experiences that are sometimes quite similar in their differences, if that makes any sense. Can you give us the, maybe the history of Hecate? It seems to me that she's uh, much older than the accepted Greek goddess of the underworld. Uh, it seems to me she is one of the actually one of the primeval creator deities, isn't she? It's very difficult to know exactly where she originated from. In the book, I created a small timeline showing the earliest literary references to her, which is the 8th century BCE. 
and the oldest known votive offering to her, which is the 6th century BCE. However, even in that earliest literary reference, which is from the Theogony by Hesiod, it's clear that Hecate's worship and the fact that she was venerated was already very well established. We know from depictions of Hecate that she was often shown alongside Hermes with the mother goddess Kybele, and we can only speculate really what her true origins are. We know that Kybele is one of the oldest mother goddesses, um, the earliest known depiction of a goddess who's believed to be Kybele dates to about the sixth, sorry, the sixth millennium. The earliest known depiction of Kybele dates to around 6000 BCE, which shows, shows a very voluptuous woman enthroned with lionesses either side of her, which is similar to the later depictions of Kybele um, during the Greek period. So it's possible that if Hecate and Hermes were connected with the cult of Kybele, that their worship and their veneration dates back to the same period. It is also possible that Hecate is a development out of the great mother mother goddess cult, so that she's actually a continuation of Kybele. That's one of the theories that is put forward. Another idea that is less popular but certainly needs to kind of be investigated a little bit more is that Hecate's origins is with that of the Minoan snake goddesses the earliest ones dating to around 1500 BCE. So there's lots of different theories of where she originated. What is very clear from the evidence is that she's not originally a Hellenic or Greek goddess. She's always considered a foreigner alongside gods like Dionysus, who's also considered a foreigner, and with whom she's also linked in some of the myths and practices. And this is from uh, the cult of Orpheus, right? Did they adopt her along with Dionysus? Yes, I mean, there's, there's many different places where Hecate is linked to Dionysus. Um, today, actually, one of the con- two of the contributors to Hecate, her sacred fires, are from Bulgaria, and they run a small organization there called Freskia, which is all about kind of reinstating the worship of the old gods. They're primary deities there based on the folklore and mythology and continuation of some of the myths and stuff of their local area is Dionysus, uh, Sabius and um, Zagreus and um, Hecate in her triple form as a moon goddess but also as a mother goddess. So um, it continues today but in the ancient world I mean a very good example is um, to be found with the mysteries of Eleusis where Hecate is depicted with her two torches and she plays a very vital and important part in the myth of the descent and ascent of Persephone, um, marking the seasonal changes. The story for people that aren't familiar with it is basically that the beautiful um, virgin goddess Persephone, or the Kore, um, is the daughter of the grain goddess Demeter. Hades, the god of the underworld, falls in love with Persephone who's the daughter of Demeter, who's actually Hades' half-sister. So it's all very, very incestuous. Hades wants to marry, in inverted commas, Persephone. And the only way to do this for Hades is to actually abduct Persephone because he knows that asking for Persephone's hand in marriage from Demeter would never work because of his own bad reputation. So he, there's a whole plot involved and various other deities are involved and Hades basically abducts Persephone from a field where she's picking flowers, takes her into the underworld um, where eventually she's hungry enough to be convinced to eat a few pomegranate seeds. This basically means that by the time that Hecate and Helios intervenes and helps Demeter to find out that her daughter is in the underworld with Hades, which needs to be done because Demeter is upset about the loss of her daughter and therefore everything on the earth starts dying, the crops are failing, this famine. And the gods have a vested interest in the fact that humans should remain alive because, of course, humans are the worshippers who make offerings to the gods. So the gods start getting involved in Hecate and Helios helps 
Demeter to find out where her daughter is. Hecate then becomes the psychopomp who goes down into the underworld to negotiate the release of Persephone, so Persephone can go back to her mother. But because she had a few pomegranate seeds, she can't actually return to the upper world, to the surface of the earth, to be with her mother permanently. So a deal is struck whereby Persephone will spend one third of the year in the underworld with her husband Hades and two thirds of the year with her mother Demeter. And this accounted for the creation of the seasons and the growing time for crops, etc. on on the earth, being two thirds of the year and the kind of barren cold winter months being the third of the year when Persephone was um, in the underworld with Hades. So, Sorita, that basically makes uh, Hecate sort of a a female version of, let's say, Hermes or Jesus, a mediator between the divine and the earthly, right? Absolutely. And in fact, very interestingly, sometimes Hermes, in some versions of the myth, it's Hermes that is depicted as being the father of that also assists in the journey of Persephone to Hades. So, you know, Hermes definitely and Hecate are very closely linked to deities. There was also depictions of and statues of Hecate and Hermes, sometimes at the entranceways to big cities. We know, for example, that there were big statues of Hecate and Hermes guarding the entranceway into ancient Athens at one point. So the two of them are very, very um, much linked together. They're also very, very liminal. And oracles, and um, you mentioned Jesus, um, oracles of Hecate to, you know, not very long ago, still treated Jesus as a messiah and as a positive force, um, though not always his followers. I've just got a little quote from it when she's specifically being asked, the oracle obviously being a priestess in trance, specifically asked what she thought about Christianity and you know, what, what what was up with Christians and how they should be treated. She said, and to those who ask why he, being Jesus, was condemned to die, the oracle of the goddess Hecate replies, the body indeed is always exposed to torment, but the soul of the pious abide in heaven, and the soul you inquire about being the fatal cause of error to other souls which were not fated to receive the gifts of the gods and to have the knowledge of the immortal Jove. Such souls are therefore hated by the gods, for they who were not fated to receive the gifts of the gods and not to know God were fated to be insult- involved in error by means of him who you speak of. He himself, however, was good, and heaven has been open to him as to other good men. You are not then to speak evil of him, but to pity the folly of men, and through him men's dangers imminent. When I, re- I recently read Barbara Walker's Man Made God, she has a chapter on uh, Hecate, or I'm sorry, I guess I should call her Hecate, but uh, it says that her name actually means word or creation. Isn't that what uh, her name means in Greek? Um, it's not clear what her name means because the name isn't actually Greek. If if it was Greek, then oh it's... yeah, she said it. I'm sorry. She yeah, she said it comes from Egyptian. That was her theory. Yeah, that there's no there's no actual fixed evidence for any particular cult. I mean, it could be Hittite, it could be one of many, many different languages. So it's not exactly known. Um, depending on the language, there's a many, 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 many different um, meanings that's been ascribed to it. Within the Greek language, it would be um, shooter from afar, based on one of the epithets of Apollo. But there's no evidence to link her specifically as being a Hellenic or Greek deity. So therefore, we have to assume that her name is neither either. And therefore, it could be anything of many things. It could even mean something, if you if you go with some of the Hittite meanings, that it could even mean ruler of fire, which fits very well with her later Chaldean um, description and the way that she's viewed in the, in the Chaldean oracle. So there's many different things that... Um, could be possible meanings for it. You, you can't really say it's one thing more than another because her origins is just too much, you know, shrouded in the mist of time and um, confusion of history going back to that period. We, we just don't know for certain. Yeah, I think that's uh, very common with gods in the Middle East and the Near East, whether it's mm-hmm. Dionysus, Isis, uh, Horus, they all get mixed up and 
split uh-huh. up into different cults, and then as time goes, they change. So it's almost like many of these gods and goddesses are interchangeable, although they sort of represent the same universal thing. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult with Hecate in particular because she's had a very bad reputation given to her in the 20th century. Um, I mean, she's always had stories and aspects linked to her that could be considered very dark and mysterious and slightly scary because power is always considered something that is scary. The thing with her is that, you know, her image in the 20th century was very, very badly affected by Alistair Crowley, who described her as a crone goddess. And ever since then, people have been describing her as such. And it's given this impression that she's a physically old woman who, you know, sends really nasty things to everybody. But that's a very kind of small view of her because with her, for example, doing the Chaldean Oracle, her, her image is very similar the descriptions of her and the powers attributed to her is very similar to Sophia. So it's not, um, you know, she's an incredibly complex goddess to try and sum up in a few um, words. And why is she called a triple goddess? She is depicted as having three bodies, three heads, um, six arms. Since around the 4th century BCE, the earliest known depiction of that was by a very famous Greek sculptor called Alcamenes. And Pausanias, the famous travel writer of his time um, in ancient Greece, writes about her as being depicted like this by Alcamenes and that subsequent statues of her was based on this triple-formed goddess. Now, it's not entirely clear why Alcamenes did this, the best possible guess for it is that Hecate was um, described in the Theogony and in many other texts as being the goddess of the earth, the heavens, and the sea, which are the three kind of main realms in you know on the earth. If you think about it, is is what goes on on the earth, within the earth, what goes on in the skies, and then what goes on in the oceans. So she was she was described as having powers over all three of these things. So that could be one of the reasons that Alcamenes was inspired to depict her like that. The other theory is that um, because of her association with Rose, and then in particular with three-way junction, Trivia, the place where three roads meet, again, the three-bodied Hecate depicts a Hecate looking into each of these three directions the roads go. So it's symbolic of her standing at the crossroads and looking down each of the three ways that are sacred to her. Often her, one of her sigils is the black dog. Why was the black dog given to her? Right, black dogs were sacrificed to Hecate and dogs in general were only sacrificed to foreign deities during the Hellenic and Greek worship of her. We know from the association with dogs that she was a foreign deity. It's one of the things that actually tell us. She was sometimes, interestingly, depicted as having the head of a dog. In the prayer to Selene for any spell on the Greek magical papyri, there's a charm made from lodestone with a three-formed Hecate where she's got the head of a dog, a horned maiden, and a goat's head. Um, there's also a pity spell of attraction where she's also got um, three heads one of which is a dog, and in John Lydus' Liber de Mensibus, he describes her with four heads, which is quite unique and is something that happens much later. Again, he describes one of those heads as being that of a dog. So she's sometimes depicted as having the head of a dog, and dogs are sometimes sacrificed to her, so hence the association with dogs. The other association with dogs comes from her father, according to the Theogony, um, in the Theogony, her father is Perseus, and her mother is the stellar goddess Asteria. And Perseus is also considered to be a foreign god. But interestingly, there are references to him as having the head of a dog. And also sometimes descriptions of him are very akin to that of the, Greek, uh, of the Greco-Egyptian or Egyptian Anubis or Anub. So there's, there's all these kind of associations with animal-headed deities. 
which is why people sometimes link her to the Egyptian pantheon, although there's no real physical evidence for that. And it must be interesting, uh, Sorita, because uh, I guess this comes to the issue of sacrifice, and I know some of your contributors deal with this. But, for example, you know, in Christianity, uh, sacrifice is done with because Jesus was the sacrifice of all times, you know. When you ask a Jew, they say, well, until we build another temple, we're yeah. not sacrificing animals. How do well, neo-pagans deal with the issue of sacrifice? Animals. Especially since so many are vegetarians, too. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually vegan. So... <laughs> It's it's not something I'm about to be um doing. I'm I I don't sacrifice animals. I don't eat meat. Um, I don't even eat dairy products. The issue of sacrifice. I mean, sacrifice comes in many different forms. Um, you mentioned Christianity. In fact, it's not entirely true to say that Christians don't sacrifice animals because there are examples all over the world. Certainly in Britain, I know of many churches where stags were still sacrificed, including St Paul's Cathedral. In um, London, really? they said, yeah, they wouldn't they get away with it. not in the United States. They wouldn't get away with it. <laughs> they, they wouldn't do it now, but up to the 16th, 17th century, you know, there there were still many examples of these kind of things being done. So I don't think that it should be taken, you know, out of context. Furthermore, um, of course, in the ancient world, even I mean, people often make a big deal out of the fact that dogs were sacrificed to Hecate. But animal sacrifice with Hecate is actually relatively rare in comparison to that with other deities. A few years ago, I also wrote a book on Artemis, looking at her history. And Artemis, also goddess of the new moon, a twin sister to the god Apollo, um, generally viewed by neo-pagans today as being a lunar goddess of the woodlands, you know, virgin goddess, really lovely goddess. But there are examples where animals were sacrificed to Artemis in quite brutal and very bloody ways, where literally there's this, this one example, for example, where two of each kind of animal were driven onto a funeral pyre and the animals were being burned alive. Ugh. If they tried escaping, they'd be caught and just thrown back on. So there's no examples like this for Hecate. So in, in comparison, the fact that animals were sacrificed to her is is not really anything, you know, out of the ordinary. The out of the ordinary part for Hecate comes in with the fact that dogs were sacrificed, which, as I said before, is a sign of the fact that she was not part of the Greek pantheon. Another interesting thing, of course, with Hecate is that many of her ancient followers were actually vegetarian. So for vegetarians looking for a goddess that is vegetarian friendly, <laughs> um, Hecate is actually not a bad goddess to work with. So contrary to this idea that, you know, more animal sacrifices need to be made to her than to any other deity, you find that, you know, philosophers such as Empodocles, who were one of the really important philosophers of the ancient world, Empodocles, in, in fact, is responsible or believed to be responsible for giving us the system of the four elements of air, fire, water, and earth. He was never named as a priest of Hecate, but there's many little clues that can be found in his work, as well as in his life and death, as it was recorded, that indicate that if he wasn't a, a you know full-on priest of Hecate, he was in the very least a devotee who was very closely linked to her, or an initiate, maybe, of one of her mysteries. Empodocles was very, very passionate about the subject of vegetarianism, so much so that in his very famous work, work Purifications, and only fragments of his work remain today, which is why, you know, again, we, we can't really tell for certain, you know, what he would have said if we know more about it. But one of the fragments that do remain and is available to us today, translated, says, and I quote, Will you not cease from the din of slaughter? Do you not see that you are the devouring each other in the heedlessness of your mind? Alas, that the pitiless day did not destroy me first before I continued the wretched deed of eating flesh with my lips. So he's quite vehemently against, you know, against people eating meat and flesh. And this is from somebody who was very 
positive about the mysteries of Hecate. Um, you know, he, he lived around the 5th century BCE. And many of the philosophers, like Hesiod as well, who um, wrote around the 8th century BCE, also um, promoted vegetarianism and was also very, very positive about Hecate's um, mysteries. And many of these philosophers that, that promoted vegetarianism believed in the kind of golden age that went before where everybody was vegetarian. For example, Hesiod wrote, wrote of the golden age saying, the fruitful grain land yielded its harvest to them of its own accord, and this was great and abundant. You know, this is back in the 8th century, and Hesiod is the person who gives us the first known literary reference to Hecate, and wrote about her in a way that was very gushingly positive. So, you know, the fact that these people that wrote about Hecate in the ancient world were also very, very strict um, vegetarians, and in fact, some of them could be um, likened to animal rights um, protesters of today in the way that they wrote about it and preached about the fact that you should not eat meat. So it's not really something that is not compatible with neo-paganism or, you know, religious or spiritual parts today. Um, I myself, I'm not a pagan, so, um, you know, I can't speak on behalf of pagans, but you know, certainly it's not something that um, I believe to be not compatible. I certainly agree with you, because even uh, before that or during that time, uh, the cults of Orpheus and the cults of Pythagoras were vegetarian, and I've read there's documentation that towards the 3rd century, even the cult of Dionysus was becoming very monastic, yes. very, you know, no meat, no, you know, very conservative in the way they treated the world. Yeah, I mean, Paul Frey as well was linked to Hecate and um, her later worship around the third century CE. And um, again, he was vegetarian and was very, very against animal sacrifice. And he's working on abstinence. He um, kind of promotes the idea that offerings to gods should be incense and vegetables and that we should stop sacrificing animals. So it's not a new age idea in the sense of, you know, new pagans being anti animal sacrifice. I mean I, I, I actually kind of, you know, like it when <laughs> because it, it for me it provides a little bit of entertainment when people accuse me of being new age because I'm vegetarian and I work closely with some of the deities I do because, you know, they're like, Well, you know, animals are sacrificed to these deities, you should you know, you should get a grip and understand that you, you're not quite understanding your drive, you know, according some, to some people. But the thing is that if you actually look at what the what happened in the ancient world, it's not that different from what some of us are doing today. The idea of just sacrificing anything willy nilly, um, you know, because I'm not, you know, I'm, I've been vegetarian for a very, very long time, all my life, pretty much since I was a small child. And I've been vegan since my my 20s, and I don't really see why there's an issue with animal sacrifice or not animal sacrifice, because I think if an animal is sacrificed for the right reason and with the kind of honour and respect that was given to it in the ancient world when it was sometimes done and how it's still done sometimes today in some religions around the world, I don't actually see a problem with it because that animal is actually being sacrificed for a very honourable purpose in some instances. I'm not saying all instances because that's not true. But if you're a meat eater, which I'm not, but if you're a meat eater, and it's quite often meat eaters that argue against the idea of animal sacrifice. I don't understand what the problem is because if you're a meat eater, animals are being sacrificed all the time for you. I thought they came yeah. from the fridge. I thought that's that where came they came from. <laughs> we don't have to watch them being killed. That's a it, it is the right? difference. It's, 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 it's people are quite completely detached from the idea of the slaughterhouse and animals being killed in sometimes very negative and scary and dirty and distressing circumstances. And that meat then ends up in the supermarket. It comes you know, ends up, like you're saying, the fridge and people 
stick it in the frying pan and eat it and you know they've got a lovely steak and you munch away and that's really nice but if you're doing that and you are also expressing an issue with animal sacrifice i i actually think that that there's a double standard i think if vegetarians want to um you know speak out against animal sacrifice then i, I that's a different matter for me and i'm speaking as a vegetarian <laughs> so it's not like you know, I, I'm not opposed to the idea of animal sacrifice within an honourable and correct, respected environment, which is often what happened in the ancient world. Not always, but what often happened and which still happens today in Judaism and in many other religions. What did happen to the worship of Hecate and how was it able to survive or go underground and then become uh, have a resurgent in modern times. That's a very interesting question. I mean, Hecate, her worship was well established, like I said, by the eighth century BC. It was very popular amongst the ordinary folk um, during the Hellenic and Greek period. People would often have shrines to her in the front, just in front of their own houses, by the doors, in their homes. It's a myth that her worship just disappeared completely because we still find that, you know, all through, from the 8th century BC, all through all the centuries leading up to the classical period in 336 BC, Hecate is, is, there's many depictions of her, there's many depictions and, and references to her in literature. We find that during the Hellenic period, the three-formed image of her becomes increasingly popular. Many, many images of her being formed in her triformis um, kind of image. Then we kind of, you know, come to the onset of Christianity. Um, obviously, Christianity starts battling with all the kind of indig the other indigenous religions of its region. But Hecate remains to be an important deity within that. Um, we found, you know, coins and other depictions of her around the time of Christ that still shows her in an important role because she wouldn't be on coins, for example, if she wasn't important. From the first century CE, there's a depiction of her um, riding a lion with a lunar crescent, for example. We find references to her in Metamorphosis by Ovid in the 8th year of the, so around the time of Christ. So she was still very, very popular. Then we've got the onset of the Roman Republic, and we still find that she is being venerated, that she's still being mentioned. The Fossalia, Lucan, She's mentioned in that. Plutarch writes about her. There's more and more Hecateons, you know, showing her again around the pillar in her three form being produced. The Orphic Hymn to Hecate, um, which was written, we don't know the exact date, but somewhere between the 1st and the 3rd century BC, um, sorry, CE, speaks about the saffron coat goddess of the heavens, the underworld, and the sea, unconquerable queen, beast, Rora disheveled one of the compelling countenance, key-holding mistress of the whole world. So we start seeing Hecate in a slightly different role after the onset of Christianity. But it is a very positive role. It is not this dark, scary chrome goddess that some pagans talk about today. We find references to her with the crescent moon more and more during this period. And then we've got Lucian writing about her. We find reliefs of her all over the Mediterranean and kind of Near East area, Bucharest. Um, there's, there's depictions of her dating to the second century. Then, of course, is the onset of the Chaldean Oracle, where Hecate is seen as an incredibly powerful but incredibly positive source of life and light and all things beautiful and spiritual, um, which is very often ignored again, you know, today by people talking about it, but I feel is incredibly important because it is it is more a direct development out of how she was seen in the ancient world 
So around the 2nd century, 3rd century, you've got some amazing descriptions of Hecate. Um, for example, you've got, I come a virgin in varied form, wandering through the heavens, bull-faced, three-headed, ruthless, the golden arrows chase, Phoebe bringing light to mortal, Elithea bearing the three sacred signs of my triple nature, in the ether I appear in fiery forms, and in the air I sit in a silver chariot. So very kind of much merged with the idea of Selene and the moon goddess. And every century, I mean, I've done a lot of research on her iconography and the symbols and stuff that are associated with her through the centuries. And, and apart from, you know, during the Dark Ages, where very little literary and art remains to be seen to, to us today about anything, really, there's references to her throughout history, it's not like her mysteries actually went away. I'm not entirely convinced that it went underground as much as she found ways of manifesting herself through the literature and the artwork of the current artists and poets and writers of each generation. And uh, Sorita, the book uh, Hecate, Her Sacred Fires, obviously gives various viewpoints and also rituals. What can uh, one expect... Uh, whether you're coming from a pagan background or Wiccan or mystic Christian or even uh, broad-minded Kabbalistic, what can you expect once you begin asking upon the gifts of Hecate? That's a very good question. I guess if you come to her without fear, then the message that is very clear from the examples of the experiences and visions that um, as I said, more than 50 people who contributed to this book has, is that she's very good at granting um, favours to those who do um, honour her. She is also a very demanding goddess who, although she doesn't seem to express the jealousy that is sometimes associated with other deities, expects a lot of work and dedication, not necessarily in the form of worship you know, on your knees, um, throwing yourself at her, but more in the sense of community and working with others and facilitating. Charity work is something that people kind of talk about quite often with her as well. So um, a lot of community work in the real world seems to be what um, people offer to her in one way or another. But she seems to be able to grant favours more easily than many of the deities that I've encountered um, in my years as a priestess within the community. And you yourself, uh, just a few minutes ago, said you don't consider yourself a pagan. So what would you consider <laughs> yourself, uh, well, who would you be called or referred to as? Sarifa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I quite like the name my parents gave me, actually. It's, 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 it's interesting. But, you know, I, I don't, I think... The terminology that is used in neo-pagan circles is very, very confusing sometimes. I don't use the term pagan or neo-pagan for myself because I don't agree with, and my practices and my beliefs does not agree with the way in which the term pagan or neo-pagan is generally defined as today. I'm also not somebody that believes that you can change the meaning of words. The meaning of words change with time. So the meaning of the word pagan and Ian pagan today for the majority of people does not equate to what I believe and what I do. I guess if I had to use a term for myself, I would probably be a penentheist or a theurgist or possibly a Gnostic, actually. I, I, I think the terminology can be very restrictive and um, I don't like being restrictive. Yeah, and besides, uh, obviously... Back in the days, people belonged to different cults and uh, worshipped different gods. Pagan, after all, was a negative term created by Christianity. So, uh, but it, it, was used by, it was used by pagans as well, for other, what, what we would think of as pagans. It was used by the temple religions, for the people who had the religion of the country, because many of the temple religions of the ancient world, certainly in Egypt, Greece, Rome, those temple religions, although not identical, obviously, to, to modern Christianity, is not that different. The structure, the hierarchy, 
um, of the temple religions of the ancient world is where the hierarchy and structure of the modern Christian church, Catholicism in particular, got their ideas from. So if you call yourself a pagan, paganus, from the you know Latin for country dweller, then um, you know I do actually live in the countryside, and um, we don't have human na- um, neighbours where we live. So I could call myself a country dweller because that's where I physically live, <laughs> but my my religion is not that of the countryside. <laughs> All right, Sorita, well, that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank you very much for uh, coming on Aeon Byte. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fascinating listening to your questions, and I hope that everybody who listens can learn something about Hecate from this. Very true. And again, the book is Hecate, or as I say, Hecate, or Sacred Fires. Good luck with the book, and good luck with promoting uh, the goddess. Thank you very much, Miguel. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. Sorita de Este on the sublime and discarnate goddess Hecate. Much of it gleaned from her new book. She is both editor and contributor of, and that is Hecate, her sacred fires. For more information on this priestess of Hecate, please visit her website, sorita.co.uk. S-O-R-I-T-A And I do like the work Sorita is doing in getting to the pearly core of paganism. Very similar to what my friend Keith Nicholson did in his book Above, Below, and Within. And it's similar to what Jim Wes and I are doing in the Gnostic community. We should be grateful for Crowley, Blavatsky, Hall, and the other 19th and 20th century occultists that helped midwife alternative spiritualities. But in recent times, there have been great discoveries in archaeology and ancient manuscripts, breakthroughs in textual criticism, and a sharpening of historical critical thinking that are there for us to really do justice to the faiths almost forgotten. And I have been called a fundamentalist Gnostic for daring to stress the importance that we get to basics in order to truly understand and walk the path of the perennial heretics. Once that is accomplished, then worthwhile innovations can be implemented. I may be a fundamentalist Gnostic, but not a sola scriptura one. I believe in tradition, theophanies, and of course, rabid reinterpretation that benefits our dark odyssey in this postmodern world. But first we have to know the knowers of the unknown. We have to use as much of our lower mind so that our higher mind, the news, can interact with it and break open our chakras and break down the archons that rule every atom of our bodies. Sadly, many modern Gnostics live in the romance of the old occultists and think they are really voicing the timeless Sophia of Valentinus, Basilides, Mani, or St. Paul. And instead of being the outsiders of Colin Wilson, they just go right inside the gangrene uterus of New Age. Anywho, I did promise or threaten you that I would show you that Hecate does indeed make it into Gnostic scripture. But unfortunately, the Gnostics made the same mistake as modern occultists did in thinking she was a demonic biatch. Or maybe they were the first to modify her in their endless reinterpretation and reconstruction of everything they got their blasphemous hands on. But again, they still knew their material, my beloved true seekers. In the Pista Sophia, Jesus takes his followers, including Mary M. and his mother, to this place called the Middle Region, a far worse place than any hell or Chuck E. Cheese's. It's a ghastly place that would bring a smile to Lovecraft, containing souls that lost their moral direction on earth and therefore beyond, they are not accepted anywhere else. Hecate, or Hecate, hangs out there with some other snarky deities, titans, and demon lords. 
She has three beastly faces, like Dante's Satan at the bottom of Hades, and at her disposal twenty-seven pretty, pretty archons, which she calls friends. I wonder if her mind is Tiffany twisted, and she has a Mercedes Benz. And Hecate's job is managing the archons to torture the souls for a hundred and five and a half years until they almost reach pure non-existence. Then they are rescued by little Sabaoth, perhaps the redeemed brother of Yaldi Baldi, as attested in the Nag Hammadi Library's Origins of the World. These souls are Federal Express back to the material world but with even less direction, constitution, and humanity. But I'm sure if you found many of the other Gnostic texts that were destroyed by orthodoxy, you might find a tale where Hecate has a different role, as do many other Greek gods here and there. After all, the Gnostics were all about writing their own gospel and living their own myth and the church fathers got their thongs in a wad because the ancient Gnostics kept doing just that. And so do we, because we are the Gnostics, the lovers of the esoterica and the Dionysian freethinkers. And I mean writing our own gospel and living our own myth, not getting our thongs in a wad, unless butt floss makes you feel electric. Anywho, we are the veterans of a thousand psychic wars who have set the controls to the heart of the sun. We are the eternal outsiders in the shadows of humanity's arrogant rule of this planet. And we like it there because that is where we can cultivate our wild noses, as Bishop Rosamond Miller likes to call it. This is the Gnostic Revival the revolution in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria so that she can make it home before the Christian mob gets her this time. This is the restoring of the divine feminine principle from those Pandoric boxes in this rabbit hole we call the universe. Let us release Sophia, the Shekinah, Athena, Huan Yi, Eurynome, Hecate, and all the goddesses of wisdom that can bring restoration to a schizophrenic creation. Or at least make Jehovah spend some time in the couch in the middle regions. But don't get too vagina loving, moon bats and neo-pagans. Like I've always said, chick rule is no better than jack T chick rule. There must be balance before there is transcendence. And the joker and the thief would agree. And I think Hecate, the primeval Logos, and Lady of the Crossroads would also agree. I am and I am Abraxas, broadcasting at the Virtual Alexandria through the God Above God Dad Cam. The road is ended, the song is over, thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers, because like heaven above you, the spy that love you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. Hello and goodbye as always. 